thank you very much, Alina. Ah, whatever is happening here. Sorry. One moment. Yes, thank you very much, Alina. So I will be talking about the optimality of the logarithmic upper bound stiff. I will make clear what I mean by that. And this is uh, this was a joint project with a research team. We got together in Oaxaca, in Mexico. Uh, and the team was composed of, uh, well, the surviving members of the team are well, myself and Emmanuel Carneiro, uh, Andres Chirre, and Julian Mejia Cordero. All right, so what are we talking about? Can everybody read my handwriting? It's not worse than on a board. Okay, so an upper bound sieve of Selberg type, or in order not to be so personalistic, uh, a quadratic upper bound sieve. Uh, for me, it's just a choice. of a function from the natural numbers to the reals with rho of d equals one for d in a certain initial interval and rho of d equals zero for d a little bit larger. So you have this function is one at first some sort of thing, d1, d2, here it will be zero, and here anything can happen. Here you're free to choose it however you want. All right, and it could be that, so d1 and d2 are given to us as parameters, so we could have to deal with the case of d1 equals one, it's one of the most common ones. It's called the one parameter case logically enough. All right, so, well, it's a choice of function, but what's the point of choosing that function? The point is to make the following sum, S rho, which is the sum for all positive integers up to big N, sum of the following squared. It's the square of the sum over the divisor z of n of mu of d rho of d, where mu of course is the Mobius function. And the point is to make this as small as possible. Given d1 and d2. Okay, and here I should explain why we care. Uh, Sorry, a little it's up here. Okay, much better. Excuse me, I'm having a little, a little a tiny blackboard inconvenience. Okay, very good. All right, so why do we care? Um, let me talk then a tiny bit about applications. So there's a classical use of sieves. That's when you are just trying to estimate the number of integers that are excluded from certain that do not fall. So you have, you're talking about the integers that are forbidden from falling into certain congruence classes modulo p for many p. So an example of a congruence class we may forbid is we could forbid the, the congruence class zero, say. That is, you could be counting a number of integers that are not divisible by any of many prime numbers. Oops. 
so um, yeah, and I'm, I've actually stated things. So that it's the, it is actually the class zero that we are excluding. I could make things a bit more general, but so. This here is an upper bound. On the number of prime numbers. Between big D and big N. No, because what happens here, um, you see, when, um, yeah, so evidently this square being a square is always non zero. And whenever you have that N is a prime number bigger than D2, you're going to have that it has, yes, it. It cannot have any prime divisors other than itself. So it cannot have any prime divisors smaller than B2. It cannot have any divisors smaller than B2 except for one. So the only term here uh, is going to be one. And so whenever you have a prime n that n is prime, this inner sum is one, if it's a prime bigger than D2. And in general, it's going to be at least zero. So this is an upper bound on the number of prime numbers bigger than these. So that's the simplest case. Um, and you could state more generally. So a classical early application was an upper bound on the number of twin primes. So of course, we believe that there are infinitely many prime numbers. We don't actually know that. But what already Brun managed to show by a different sieve in the early 20th century was that there cannot be so many. I mean, the twin primes must be fairly thin on the ground. So this will be, and that's a very classical application. It's an upper bound on the number of prime numbers. And such that n plus two is also prime. Okay, very good. So um, this is old hat for many of you. If not, it doesn't matter. But let me tell you before I really get started on the main part of my talk. Let me tell you about some interesting recent applications of this kind of C. By recent, I mean things that have been going on for the last 20 years and that are really an active field of research. So there's what people call enveloping sieves. It's an old name. It's not a perfect name because it's really the, you, you, it's not that there is a specific sieve called an enveloping sieve. It's rather that sieves can be used in the mode of enveloping sieves, so to speak. That's what you're not using this sum here, just as an upper bound uh, or to count. Rather, uh, this is used as a weight to bias n towards primes. Because there are limitations that sieves have, well known limitations, so called parity problem. That sieves have when used on their own, but you would, then you would, you may want to combine sieves with other powerful techniques. And what you do then is you use this weight, which is a very beautiful weight, especially when D two is not too large. It's it's distributed. I mean, you can easily prove that it's well distributed to a greater extent than primes themselves are, or to a greater extent than the generalized Riemann hypothesis tells you that primes are. So use use it as a weight to buy a cent towards primes, and then you work further using other techniques. So, so you find this, this used to be known to the specialists, so to some specialists, so you find this in the works of Holly and Ramare. And then in the wider number theoretical public, I think really became aware of this, use of the sort of technique with the work of Colson, Pins and Gilderim, taken further by Polymath, Maynard and so forth. I'm not being mean to Jan, it's just that Jan's innovation is more or less orthogonal to this, and you can also find this in Green Tao and so forth. 
Yeah. Personally, I came into the subject in a somewhat different way. It's also that sieves like these can appear in a, in a way that is completely uninvited, so to speak. So you, you are, you know, you are a happy person using Bond's identity in your daily life. And then you Koshi Schwartz because that's what you, we do half of the time. And then you are dealt, you, you, you have to bound sums like this. And you can do that, though, you know, this is not as big as it looks. This is of size about a constant times n. But then you can ask yourself, well, what if I'm a bit cleverer and um, I use a smooth, or somebody tells you, why, why are you not smoothing your sums? Always smooth. So you use a smooth once identity and hope to get improvements. And You use a smooth bonds identity and Cauchy Schwartz, and you are dealt, you are led to sums of this form. So rho will be some smooth weight. Right, so th this is sort of thing that crop tapping my work on three primes especially in the second version. And um, also th this this if has cropped up in other ways. So see also, for instance, uh, Graham's work on Linux, on Linux constant. So what I'm saying is that this quadratic family of sieves is particularly interesting because um, it's it uh, it's actually quite useful for what when you give certain not completely traditional uses to sieves and it's also natural enough that it crops up on its own naturally while you are doing other things it's a sum of squares that does show up spontaneously all right well let's go back to the problem of making S row as small as possible. So let's look at the, at the case of one parameter first, d1 equals one. Then um, we actually know exactly what is a row for which m row, uh, no, sorry, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. I did because I defined S row, not m row. Um, where is my page one? One second, naughty page one. All right. So before I go to D1 or M row, let me, so we were at the stage of minimizing. I'm having a little problem here. Okay, much better. So, very good. So it is easy. There's a, a further reason why we, we care about this particular kind of sieve, namely, Sieves are usually limited. I mean, if your function, you can define other sieves that are not quadratic in terms of functions, but then you have the sieve support, which in this case goes from one to d two. And if your if the square of your sieve this of your of the length of your sieve support d two is greater than big n, then you are usually stuck. Your error term blows up. There's nothing you can do. That's not the case for this kind of sieve, at least not necessarily. Um, but let us focus for now. So the simplest, it's very simple to see that you can have this expression where M In fact, you can gain a power of log here, usually. 
D1, D2. No. So we want to minimize him row. It's also possible, and this is important, to give that bounds that are that are useful when d2 squared is of the same order or greater than n. And that's that's actually important, something important about quadratic sieves. Then you don't have a reduction to m row, you have a reduction to something that is similar to m row. But for now, let us focus on m row. Harold, just one second. Uh, yes. Sometimes your um, um, the sound is not very good. It's uh, maybe you touch the microphone or the, um, uh, the microphone. Okay. Let me see. Because sometimes it goes uh, the the sound goes a bit soft. Um, yes. Um, now it's okay. Now it's okay. The sound. Maybe that I'm getting away from the microphone. Let me raise the microphone, perhaps, so the distance of the microphone is constant. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, one I think that might be better. Is this good now or not? It, it's, it's good, yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we want to minimize some row. Very good. So let's consider the one parameter case first, say d1 equals one. Then m row is minimal. For Selbert's choice. So it's row Selbert. And then m row is like this. That's exactly this. Where C zero is gamma plus all right. Um, so far, so good. Well, and this is even negative, and that's very nice. <coughs> so you might think, end of story, at least for the one parameter case. But for many applications, there are technical reasons why Rose Selberg, which actually I haven't written down, is not so good because it is it is not anything continuous or monotonic. It jumps all over the place. It's a, you can write, yeah, asymptotically it's a product of a continuous factor and an arithmetical factor. You can always express it in that way. And uh, by arithmetical, I mean that um, rho of n always depends on the divisibility properties of n. So it's not going to have any sort of nice plot. And for any for many purposes, it is better to work with row monotonic. Astral server is not. And or with row of t a rescaling of a given continuous H. So we will do a Logarithmic rescaling, it's natural enough in this context. So say rho of t, rho h of t. We're going to do it in this way. Log d to t, log d, <coughs> log d to 1, d1. Simply so that, I mean, here this is just a logarithmic rescaling and here we're bringing it to the same, to the right scale. 
<coughs> what do I mean <coughs> by the right scale? So h is going to be a function on the reals with h of x equals zero. Very good. In that case, what you have is that when t is less than d1, this one, this argument is going to be bigger than one, and so you have h of, that h of x has to be one. That's what we wanted. For t less than d1, this thing is one. For t greater than d2, we're going to have that this is negative, and so h of that will be zero again, as we wanted. Um, so Rosenberg is not of this form. There is one particular choice of H that has been studied plenty. So it's the choice, which is just, you know, so it's going to be zero here, it's going to be one here, and it's the simplest choice. It's just a linear function here. Zero, X, one, zero for X less than zero, one for X greater than one, All right, so this was studied first by Barban and Behov. Perhaps I didn't mention having on the first slide. So important, they are the first ones to really study this in detail. Motohashi. Ram. Yeah. And other people in the same time period. So the the, base, the basic theory was really developed in the late 60s to early 80s. And then the subject seems to have lain more or less dormant on what you have later is much later. is that this kind of stuff gets retaken and has a spectacular application in Golson Prince Yildirim, it's following Golson Yildirim's first paper. Again, Prince's contribution was, yeah, uh, actually it does have more to do with this than Jung's, but probably mass, so, so still, probably math, Maynard, there's also a recent paper by Vadwani. All right, but what you have here is really, as I said, generaliz generalizations and some very beautiful applications. Um, yeah, you also find it in the work of Ethan and Tao, as I mentioned before. But I would say our feeling was that, um, yeah, the study of the basic theory has been left partly incomplete has been cultivated in the 70s up to the early 80s, and then there were some gaps there that has, you know, and, and the recent work had not really been, it well, had not been its task to uh, fill those gaps and to really complete the theory. So what was the state of the theory? For d1 equals to 1, in the one parameter case, the main term is the same as in Selberg. So this isn't the work of Graham. So the, 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 yeah, so since Selberg CV is optimal, the, then this has to be the optimal main term. And then in some very recent work, so it's, uh, it's this, uh, um, a thesis of one of my students. So, so 
you can actually show. So Sebastian managed to uh, figure out the second term. Yep. Okay. Where k he managed to show is zero point six zero seven three one. It's tricky to give a, a close expression for it, but he managed to show that it is the actual value, or that it lies between that these first five digits are correct. For general d one and d two. The main term is one over log d two d one, um, and this is optimal. Oh, and this can, um, yeah. Whether it was known that it the main let, let's say that it was it was known that the main term was optimal, though it's a little bit hard to keep track of, to to pinpoint exactly where that stated. Um, and what I had shown, say, this came up while preparing the second version of the three prime proof. So the, I had worked out, you know, the, 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 yeah, the second order term. Uh, for the case that we will not be discussing today so much, the case of the two greater than square root of n. Now, then, then the analysis gets trickier in some ways, but in the end, you reduce things to expressions that are not the same, but are analogous to the ones we will consider. Um, yeah. And here, again, the second order term is negative, so. I'll tell you in a moment what the second order term here is. Um, at any rate, so what about lower order terms? So this has been, has been, as I said, partially worked out very recently. So the lower order terms were not known and they were partly worked out in what you, you know, one of the iterations of the infinite C prime manuscript, mostly available on my web website by now, end of advertisement. Um, and End of apology for taking so long. At any rate, um, what about lower order terms? Those have been those were partly worked out, but only very recently. They were not known in the seventies and eighties, uh, and I haven't seen them anywhere. And also, the question is, what? So, are they optimal for H? And if not, you know, what are the optimal values? And when do you get the optimal values? All right. So let me state the main theorem. So, um, part eight. So the one parameter case would be for D one equals one, the quantity we, have, so we want to minimize is, you know, M rho. So let's do it for m row h zero. So this confirms Sebastian's result. We are following different methods. So he was following the same kind of methods. So the, these two results here on the left side, um, the, the results from just a year ago or a couple of years ago, were following a real analytic approach. We follow a more complex analytic approach and we get the same re the same. Yeah, in fact, one can do quite a bit better than log cube two here. Actually, just let me let me see the, the actual truth. Uh, where kappa again? It's something that we can. Yeah, and then we don't really have a hard limit for when the computation has to end. Um, 
And what is really important is that this is optimal. Not just the main term, but the second order term. So the simple choice that Van de Hove made is actually the best choice, and not just when it comes to the main term. So you can't do better. Than one over log d2. Yeah, at least up. the second order term is optimal. If there's any wiggle room, it would have to be so far down that yeah, it, I'm skeptical that that's, even that is possible, but um, we can sh show that for in general, for H continuous and for, you cannot do better than this. Um, what about Selberg C? Well, there is one condition. So you need, seems to be scalings of a fixed age. Of course, you could say, well, I can play tricks with that. Yeah, but the condition is just that for this, you um, have the condition that the total variation of the derivative of h be finite and that it be bounded. You know, the constant here will depend on Harald? On the total variation of each kind. Yes. We have a question from the audience from Fabian Patsuki. Fabian, maybe you just unmute, yes, unmute your microphone and ask away. Hi, uh, <clears throat> hi, Harald. Just a quick hi. question. You say that uh, the, the, the result is optimal for this value of kappa, but uh, yeah, so it means you have. The, no, not that it's optimal for the value of kappa. The result is optimal, period, that the kappa here is optimal. Yes. So it means that the kappa, you have a closed formula for it? Can you define yes. kappa? Yes, it's a little, uh, okay. Let me go to the next page then. One moment. Uh, one moment. It's an integral, it's not that closed, but. Uh, well, you ask for it, so don't complain when they write a big formula. Oh, I'm not scared. <laughs> Well, I haven't written down what h of t is yet. So this this is what, and by the way, the computation here is rigorous with integral arithmetic, the integration is rigorous, everything is rigorous. And h of t here is an infinite product. At the end, I will talk, if there is time, about how on earth you do rigorous computations with integrals of infinite products, but it is very much possible that, and it doesn't have to take a, lot, a long time. Okay, you asked for it, so don't blame me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Happy okay, now? Okay. Uh, all right. Now, the second part. For D1, D2 general, and row H0, it's going to be 1 over log D2, D1. Plus, and here we have log cube D2, D1. So this is two kappa here. Again, this is optimal. No, 
and again she has implied constant. Depends on the total variation of And to be really technical, to show is we can't do better than so the main term is optimal that was known. The second order term is optimal. And then you know there might be hypothetically there might be improvements in really lower order terms. And how far down it goes, it's a little bit worse than in the first case, but there you have it. Okay. And there are several directions in which these may still be taken. There's work to do. So, um... yeah, so for instance, the case of this d2 squared is greater than n. I, I may do that in the final, finally, final version of the three prime book. Bear with me, um, at least to some extent, and with fully explicit constants. In the, uh, let's not talk about that. So there's this thing. It's an interesting question. Um, there are other things that one might consider. So, for instance, is uh, how do you combine this with a preliminary, a preliminary sieve? So you, you can find this in, in my work and the work of Sebastian. So say sieve only odd numbers and so forth. Now, so actually this second task is quite easy and we might include it in the paper. I think we will not just so not to make it over long. But for instance, if you just are sieving, if you try to, yeah, a note for the real insiders. So uh, kappa is actually, so kappa, you see that the second order term here is negative and that's really very convenient for many practical applications. It's not quite large enough to give you Brun-Titch march without an error term right away. However, if you decide to restrict to odd numbers and you do get Brun-Titch march, I think, you know, Montgomery Vaughan strengths Brun-Titch march right away. I'm just trying, okay, other people can, Listen again, I was just trying to give the real insiders the accurate measure of um, exactly how strong the result is. All right, very good. So let me get started on the proof. I have 20 minutes or 15 minutes? 15, 20 minutes you can, you can take. This is the advantage of this online seminar that I can go. So Yes. So the first half of the work is proving the following proposition. And I should know, I should say that I, I believe this was half known. So not with um, the main term was known. So when you have this function, this absolutely continuous. with h of x of x zero and you define rho as before no. um, then m rho which is a quantity we want to minimize is going to be h prime squared or log d2, d1, um, all right, so the main term is going to be this, it's going to be the L2 norm squared of H prime. And here, as I was saying, the main term here was known. You can find that in uh, C polymath 14. Of course, sometimes you have to say that something is first found in the literature in a certain place, 
but it was sort of recent folklore was in the air. For Swiss polymath, you don't even have to make the distinction because polymath is sort of the aggregation of wisdom, common wisdom at a, to some extent, common wisdom at a certain point. So I could add recent folklore, as in some polymath people have told me that they sort of, they already knew this before starting the project, but I think that's known, that's true by definition for polymath. But it's not to be found in the literature from the 70s. Yeah. But what you find in polymath is this main term times one plus beta log of one. And for our work, we really need to figure out a smaller arithmetic here. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see, well, in fact, what we need and prove is also a bilinear version. Yeah, but I, I will not do that right here simply for simplicity. It's proved in exactly the same way. Yeah, well, once you have that, Yeah, then, then it's clear right away that the main term here is going to be, um, the, the main term is going to be optimal for h plus h zero because it's just going to be Cauchy Schwartz, right? So. Because h goes to one. So it's clear that you're not going to do get a better term, a, a better main term than h zero just from this. And then you can work further. What happens when you wiggle things a bit? That's why you need a bilinear version to prove optimality. So you see where this is going. But first let me let me sketch for you a proof of the proposition. Because it's not so, not so obvious. And, and this sort of complex analytic method has precedence in the work of Motohashi, and you can find something a bit like that in polymath as well. But one has to be careful with the procedure because we are aiming at a, at a more or less precise error term. And then we will have to iterate to make this smaller, but one thing at a time. So this can be expressed as a double contour integral. And here you're going to have a delicious series, but in order to make it nicer, you can write, you can put some zetas into it. Then everything converges more nicely. And that's something that will be useful in the future. Anyway, you have, this really starts as a delicious series where it's not obvious that there are zetas in there, but once you factor out some zetas, it becomes something nicer. So uh, here, f of s is just a main transform. And gs1, s2 is going to be a product. And this is going to be bounded on a strip around real particle zero. It's p1 plus s1. You don't have to read all of this. The important thing, as I said, is that it's bounded on a strip. All the nastiness goes into the factors of theta. All right. So forget about that expression for G. All that we need is that G that is greater than, say, one fifth minus one fifth. So what you start is, so you let C be your classical contour. So just your classical contour for the prime number theorem is placed by one. Uh, 
And what you do is you move your, so you, you know, you start with, this is, you start with two contours to the right of the y-axis. Then you move one of the contours to the classical contour and you invert the order of summation. Now you shift to the left and then for, then you're going to pick up a pole a simple pole at S2 minus S1. So you are going to end up with a double integral as your error term. And as your main term, you're going to have the contributions. So for each, the instead of the integral here, you're just going to have one term, one contribution coming from the simple pole. So you're going to have an integral of contributions. Right. And then what you can do is this integral, which is the main term, well, it's in the classical contour, but you can displace this classical contour again. Why not? Let it be on the y-axis. This is an integral on the classical contour twice, it's the error term. So what I'm going to have is, so I displace it to the y-axis and then Just have this integral. Yeah. How do you cope this, with this sort of thing? So by Planchagall, you actually can work out what will turn out to be the main term of this main term, because if you just have t squared, if I t squared here, sort of, sensible approximation, as we shall see. This is just going to be h prime x squared dx. And so it remains to bound it minus it. Yeah. And this, actually, this converges nicely is much nicer than what we had here. So this is O of t to the fourth, as t goes to zero, it's not hard to show. And also you have that, uh, this term here, which looks nasty, actually increases very slowly. Uh, you forgetting anything? No, I think it's correct. And for continuous age, this has faster decay than t squared. So this is all good. It has it before. Um, hence this is. Okay, well, then this is a basic idea in the one parameter case. That's how you work out uh, the, uh, what, what things are for H0, at least at first. 
at least as far as the main term is concerned. Um, and then for the second order term, what do you do? So for D1, D2 general, this is actually very straightforward. Um, what you have is must give, must give a better bound for uh, here. I repeat myself. Where H, which is the H from the beginning, is DIT minus IT. And F of S is the Mellin transform of H0. So let us focus on H0 right now. As we may, since we already know that whatever gives you the optimal main term will have to be H0 plus something smaller that we know from already from the main term that we worked out. Um, yeah. For H0, this is going to be worked out like this. Yeah, and then you can actually get a gain from the fact that it is oscillatory. Very good. So just do the analysis. You shift some contours and you're happy. For D1 equals one, you have to do more careful analysis. Some more careful analysis, you have that the error term And again, it's something that you can do exactly for h equals h0. And then what you do is you use your previous work to say for a general h, in order to get to help to get the right main term, I'm going to have h0 plus a small displacement. And then you recur. Oh, so it's All right, I don't want to really get into the details of the recursion in order to make the error term smaller, the, the iteration really. Um, let me just tell you something that some of you may be asking yourselves. Well, I already mentioned it once. How to compute this kappa here rigorously? And this is important. It's not just that I keep something into the computer, we actually prove well, using a computer that this value has, you know, that its first six significant digits are such and such. All right, so um, this integral, of course, has different chunks. So in the range, yeah, zero epsilon, you do a Taylor expansion. H of t in the range t to the to infinity, which you use explicit bounds for one over the zeta. And in fact, by use, well, I also we had to prove them because what happens is complex analytic methods were not being used for cancellation very much because um, I mean until recently there were basically no explicit bounds in the literature for this, and it was believed that they were going to be horrible. Now, so there is, there are some bounds by Trajan, but they have a constant in front, which is like, best of case is something like, well, it, it's more than a thousand, it has four digits. Um, so that's too much for computations. You don't, something that is as a million times log is not good enough. So we actually managed to improve Trajan's bounds using some other bounds by Trajan and basically his method, but there were some optimizations to be done. And so this is something reasonable. So. Yeah, um, yeah, and you can use this. This is probably about 10 to 20 times worse than the reality, but uh, it's already good enough that you can show that when big T is safe, 
20,000, the tail, the tail of our integral is going to be quite small. And then what remains, of course, is to, well, how do you deal with h of t, which is an infinite product? Nowadays, yeah, there are finally, you know, consumer end products that, so to speak, uh, that let you do integral arithmetic and rigorous integration without really getting into the guts of things. So, we used integral arithmetic, or rather ball arithmetic, because we were using R, which has a nice integration feature. Um, the, really, the question is how to up, how do you best approximate? Because what happens is H is a slowly convergent product. So how do you approximate it well by a finite product? Well, already in order to express H of T as something that was clearly bounded on a strip we had to take out factors of zeta. So what we do is just, we take out more factors of zeta. So this is a very old idea. Uh, the earliest reference I, I found is in a paper by somebody called Western in the twenties, which says that basically Littlewood gave him that idea. Yeah, and I think this idea is, an idea like this is, is used, well, the logarithm of this idea is used in Paris to, uh, to some, uh, to accelerate convergence of some infinite sums. I don't think Paris does the rigorous error bounds, but I don't know. Um, at any rate, so, this is an old idea, and what you have is that h of t, for instance, you can write h of t as we already were taking out. Now, you want to get values of zeta that look like it, that um, get rid of the lower order terms. And so what you will have is a very rapidly convergent series. And you can work out more terms. And when I was giving this talk for the first time just two months ago, uh, and Max Planck, um, Don Seguir was in the audience and he told me that what he would do, so we have, we, we do well enough with what I am writing, so we have a few terms and then we have an infinite product that, converge, that converges quickly. So it can be truncated after a few terms and then you just estimate the tail. Yeah, so what Don Seguir was telling us is that in fact, he could show that, um, yeah, you, you can actually express h of t as an infinite product of values of zeta, and then uh, truncate that using, uh, yes, yes, using your standard facts, standard bounds on zeta. So that's an alternative way of doing it. Yeah, though, you know, Yes, uh, so actually Peter Morey, who is also in the audience, pointed out, you do have to do a little bit of this. You have to at least uh, include the factors two, or two and three, or otherwise your, uh, your infinite product of values of zeta doesn't converge that nicely. So some combination of the two. Yeah, and that's basically it. So I think my time is up. Yeah, so that's where we have left things. Um, I hope that you have all found something of interest in this talk. But the main moral is that, yes, the um, function that people were using is the optimal one, and not just as far as the main term is concerned, but also as far as lower error terms are concerned, uh, lower terms are concerned. And you can work out this, the, the second order term precisely, it has a nice constant, and what's really important is that it's negative, and that helps you for many things in daily life. Thank you so much.